welcome to episode 82 of My Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn. Today, I'm speaking with Kate Deering for the second time. Kate Deering is the author of the book, How to Heal Your Metabolism. I recommend this book to pretty much everybody that sends me a message asking, what do I do about hypothyroidism or diabetes or autoimmune conditions? Really any condition, because if your metabolism is suppressed, then you're going to have a total system breakdown of every organ, tissue, and gland, because every cell in the body requires active thyroid hormone, which is T3 thyroid hormone. And if the liver isn't functioning, and you're not supporting the metabolism because we've been programmed from all of these diet books and all of these fads and fasting and intermittent fasting and autophagy and all these buzzwords and fads that just totally brainwashes us into wrecking our metabolism because we're not giving the body what it needs. We're living out of balance. We're living on a backup system. We're living on a credit card, basically, and we're never paying back the bank. So... This is an awesome introduction to that question, what do I eat? Uh, there's a lot of great recommendations in the book, very simple. At the end of the book, there's actually different sections on breakfast and different breakfast ideas and recipes, smoothies. She has snack recipes on there, uh, cooked uh, fruits cooked apples, she has a liver and onions recipe, potato potato butternut squash recipe, uh, cod with coconut sauce, uh, beef bone broth, um, a list of the best proteins, uh, best fats, hoofas to be avoided, the oils to avoid. Um, it's just a great book that People can read really quickly and just get a good idea of where to start on this whole journey. So this episode covers a pretty extensive question and answer. And this is even like a FAQ of frequently asked questions because I get these questions a lot myself. So she'll answer top three tips for gut healing. Uh, do cold drinks lower the metabolism? Uh, caffeine versus decaf, her thoughts on green tea, uh, weight loss in general, what do you do if you have trouble uh, gaining weight, how to go about adding back in carbs after someone's been keto for a while, which macronutrient should you lower to lose weight, what does sweating and BO or body odor mean, what do you do about candida, uh, too much acidity in the body, uh, tooth decay, talk about vitamin D, recovering from veganism, uh, best brand of thermometer, lots of questions. It was a really fun interview, kind of rapid fire style. So here we go. Enjoy. All right, we're here with Kate Deering, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Matt. Happy to be back with you. Yeah, thanks so much for taking the time. Um, when I first learned about this uh, metabolic supportive lifestyle and um, just kind of this more balanced way of, of nutrition and living, um, your book was actually um, my intro to it. And I found Ray Pete and his information was just so hard to get through. And I quickly found your book and that just super accelerated my, my journey. And it was very, a very easy read, um, very informative, very just to the point. And um, I recommend it almost every day to people when they ask, where do I start? I'm like, just read Kate's book and uh, people love it. And of course it's not, you know, all the information. Uh, I'm sure you're like me where it's like, we're always learning and stuff, totally. but it's, it's at least a good start, right. For people to jump from. Yes. Yeah. And that's how it was designed. And I think I had the same probably experience as most people when they find Ray. It's so much and it's so different and it's so detailed. It's 
you don't know what to do or where to start. So the whole goal of that book was to give a, a deeper understanding of his work that was easy, easier to digest for most people. So that's, mm -hmm. yeah. Is it as complex as his work? No, certainly not. It is, um, it, it's just easier for the basic human without trying to dig dive into all of his research to understand essentially. Yeah. I don't think most people, unless they're, like us in the field studying or talking to other people in the field, it's like they don't need to know the sci science and pyruvate dehydrogenase and all the steps and all these things. They don't really care. They're just like, okay, what do I do? So, uh, yeah, 100. No, no, most people don't have the bandwidth for all of it, you know, and then if, because if, in even that book, you know, I was told many times it's, you know, it, it's too much because the first chapters are a little bit more scientific, although they're pretty basic, but for some people, it's going to be too much. And I can, that's why I put the, the, the end, what do you need to know at the end of each chapter? If you just, that's all you can do, then that's all you can do. At least it'll give you something um, to, to work with. The cliff notes. Cool. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk about just briefly, uh, because it's definitely just being dramatized and I think overplayed at this point, but the whole, you know, uh, SARS-2, COVID, whatever you want to call it thing. And, uh, just all the hysteria about it. And I don't know, I've, I've had friends that say, you know, you know, Ajahn's Fonder Planets, you know, the raw primal guy, he, he has a lecture, you know, and I listened to it saying viruses like don't exist or something. <laughs> like there's all these different opinions. Yeah. Right. And then I've met people like someone working in my house where his dad was dying of it and people that, you know, but I don't know, even the tests are kind of sketchy and there's just a lot of stuff that we don't know. I guess. Yeah. And that's kind of what you were saying before we started recording, right? Like we won't know for a while what's actually going on. I think, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'm certainly, uh, I, I couldn't say I'm an expert at coronavirus. I certainly look at the data and kind of try to establish my, myself from my own level of, you know, I guess I refer to it as the panic or fear level, because I think that is that, that button is being hit a lot right now. And, you know, and so you, for me, understanding the numbers and better certainly puts things in perspective to figure out like how do we need to really navigate through this. Um, <clears throat> you know, I like I said, I don't think we'll really know the levels of of what this virus is and what it's doing until years from now. It seems to me, you know, I mean, obviously, and I'm sure you've realized it's like certainly a, a disease that is affecting more of the sick and elderly for sure. Um, the numbers don't certainly mean like children and small children and young children aren't seem to be affected. Um, the flu, you know, the numbers for the flu are far greater as, as far as death rates um, when it comes to coronavirus and children. So, I mean, ultimately, yeah, I'm with you. I hear people that have had family members severely sick and um, no one I know has gone to the hospital and been, you know, in a, in a, on a vent or, um, been in ICU. I've certainly known a lot of people sick, a lot of teenagers, 20 year olds, um, and they all seem to be fine for some level. You know, it's a, kind of a bad flu to them. You know, I guess in my brain, I'm like, you know, those are the people that probably need to go out and get exposed. And I mean, that's, you know, I'm very pro Sweden is that's my, my mental thought process through this. I think that they actually used data that was, this is how we usually would do it. We wouldn't normally lock down entire nations keep everyone from their livelihoods. I think the back end of what's, what we're doing uh, could be dramatically worse than what's happening right now. But, you know, everybody is very single focused, I see, you know, and, and a lot of matters these days um, where they're just kind of looking through their own lens and seeing what they want to see. And if, when you're fear based, um, your lens and your emotional state is only going to let you see so far. So it's really hard to, to, to broaden your, your vision when you're in that state. And, and, you know, and certainly if you're you're watching the mainstream media, that's exactly what they want you to feel and do. And it's keeping people a little paralyzed. And, you know, I, I find that quite sad. Yeah, I mean, it, you just see the people with the masks and there's countless memes on it, but the people with the masks are buying, you know, drinking diet soda with high fructose corn syrup, you know, out of plastic. And just all these it's like they're, they're shopping at Walmart for their groceries and wearing a mask. It's like, they're not, the, the focus is definitely not where it should be, which to me is like homesteading, animal agriculture, building soil, clean air, water, the, the real stuff that matters. 
Yes. You know, I mean, I think it comes all under the lines of what is quick and easy, right? I mean, and, and then you have the entire, um, I, I like to refer to it as moral supremacy, whereas people are taking these stances, like I'm wearing a mask and so I'm better than you and you are, you know, look, look at you, you're, you're not, you, you don't care about mankind. I'm trying to save ma mankind, I'm wearing my mask. And again, I mean, I'm not for or against masks. I think if you should want to wear a mask, you should wear a mask. You know, I think the data, it, there's no clear data. And again, you know, maybe at some point we'll have more clarity on that as well. Um, but ultimately it's like the amount of shaming that's going on in the, today's world, the amount of like, I, you just see it, that people are just beating each other up for, for whatever reasons that they think that you're not helping mankind. And I'm like, okay, you know, everyone, if everyone literally took care of themselves and was responsible for their health and their livelihood and so forth, you know, isn't that part of the bigger problem at this point? And, you know, instead of pointing the finger at everybody else, maybe take a second and look at your life and go, hey, how can I improve upon my life so that maybe there's less stress, fear, disease in this world? And if, you know, if you have room to improve, then maybe, you know, you need to just shut it for a while so that, you know, because again, like we're all wanting to point the finger at, and we all have room for improvement here. Yeah, definitely. Even uh, I've been reading the King James Bible a lot recently, and there's even a scripture that says, you know, before you um, try to remove something from someone's eye, forget the exact line. I'm not good at quoting scripture, but remove the the from your remove the moat from your own eye first. So basically, before trying to fix someone else, fix yourself first. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's very valid today. You know, and yeah. I, I mean. And, you know, and I, I, I wrote a post about this, I don't know, probably a month or so ago. And it was, <clears throat> I was going to get some food at a, at a place that was serving food outside and um, people were driving up. I was standing outside. You could drive up or walk up and get the food and people were driving up. They, they had masks in their car, wearing them in their car because they were opening their windows. You know, again, totally fine. Um, and then they were just sitting there pulling over to the side with their gas on and just letting, you know, the, the gas run for a good 10 minutes why they sat in their car with a mask and there was all these people outside. And I was just sitting there going like, how does this make any sense? Right. I mean, you're polluting every human out here um, and you're in your car with your mask. And it's like, this, this is the hypocrisy that you just see going on on so many different levels. And so, you know, to me, like, yeah, before you start pointing fingers and telling everyone how wrong they are, um, literally look at yourself and go, how perfect are you? And if we all just focused on ourselves versus everybody else, then guess what? We'd probably all be doing a lot better at this place. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I just had a, the world's top permaculture guy on named Jeff Lawton and uh, he's in Australia and just, he turns like deserts into forests and he's big into food forests and trees and fungal relationships with the soil and really smart guy. And he was uh, kind of extreme, but I agreed with him where he was saying that humanity should kind of split to uh, smart cities on one side and then people who can grow their own food and actually steward the land on the other side. And he was like, people that don't want to grow their own food, they can move into the smart cities and eat lab grown meat and all that. Stuff. And then people that want to do permaculture and support the soil and have chickens and animal agriculture, they can you know, and that'll kind of create two species of human beings. And I was like, it's pretty extreme, but I like it. He was like, that's, make it illegal. That to sounds pretty extreme. <laughs> right? Well, and I, I mean, I guess on some level you have that choice, right? I mean, we all have choice, right? And obviously right. you made a choice to, to move out and kind of live that life. And, you know, and if that works for you, I mean, I probably, maybe it wouldn't work for everybody. And I mean, and, and there's got to, to me, there's always got to be some sort of happy medium, you mm -hmm. know, that we have to look at, but mm -hmm. with, the high levels is, you know, the high levels of toxicities of living in a, in a city, whether it's pollution or EMFs or toxic water or toxic food. I mean, you just have to find your balance. And if that mm -hmm. environment is making you sick, then yeah, you have to probably move out of that. I mean, you can try the best, right? We all, you all try your layers initially. All right, eat a better diet. Did that work? Yeah. No. Okay. Clean your water. Did that work? No. You know, so you figure out what has to work for you, you know, you, and you always dose it to a point where you kind of have to try to do the least amount to get the best result. But when you hit that toxic exposure and you get really, really sick, um, your body's going to be affected by everything. So you might have to remove a lot of those substances to kind of get some back homeostasis and, to, and then you can kind of build on it. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, our environment is, is very toxic. 
today's world. Yeah. Yeah. Elon Musk just put up uh, SpaceX satellites pretty close to us. And so wherever you go, there's always going to be something. But uh, I guess if something goes down, everyone's armed. So <laughs> they can just take the, they might not last. But <laughs> but, right. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's the common thought, right? And it just seems like the, the more toxicity we create, then we will just create more drugs, yeah. <laughs> vaccinations or anything else that we think will counterbalance that. Right. And so I've had these discussions with people that you're like, well, we're still living longer. I'm like, well, that's ne negotiable at this point. But I think we're we might be living longer, but we're sicker and we're living longer. You know, we're not healthier people. We're just sicker people being kept alive by modern <laughs> medicine. <laughs> And, you know, and, and, and yes, maybe those people wouldn't have lived 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago to the length. But I mean, are they truly that healthy? You know, I think that's very negotiable. Yeah, I think Georgie that I've had on the show a few times now, he was saying that even young people are as, as sick as the elderly now, like people in their like 20s and 30s and even have cancer coming like in the teens. And we're just getting to a crazy scenario. Like, yeah. So. I mean, when, when like type two diabetes started showing up in children, right. It, it was like adult onset before now it can't be called that because 12 year olds get it. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is crazy. But yeah, I mean, can, I mean the cancer and just all the mental disorders and everything that children and, and you know, where is it coming from? I don't know. I mean, 17 different places probably. Can we isolate one thing? No. I mean, because we, we can't, we just, we're not going to isolate variables like GMOs or vaccines. It's really hard to do that, but it's logical to think they probably all could be contributing. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> they're chemicals. You're putting them in the body and they're doing disruption for sure. Yeah. Yeah. When I worked at a juvenile detention facility for four years as a substitute teacher, I just seeing the tap water drinking and just the, the processed lunches and just the air they were breathing, just seeing like all the combo of stuff and all the Wi-Fi signals that were stacked. Like these kids are not only locked up, but they're locked up in a really toxic environment. And it's kind of depressing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then they, and then, you know, it's kind of, we know, I mean, then, you know, you're kind of sick a person, then they, they breed other sick, you know, mm -hmm. then that just kind of happens. And then like, to actually get that person well with, you know, generations of sick people, takes an immense amount. I mean, what was it? Uh, Pottinger, mm -hmm. Pottinger's cats. I think it, he showed that it was like three or four generations to get out of the disease that they had created through one generation. Right. Huh. And so that's pretty extreme. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask, uh, just moving on from the coronavirus, uh, or before we move on from that, have you looked into like methylene blue and like UV or visible light being used against it? Because that keeps popping up in my research. Um, if it is a real thing, which I think it is to some degree. I briefly looked into that. I mean, um, I like to do it. I'll put it that way. You know, I do very, I mean, I've heard people talk about doing five grams and all sorts of craziness. And, you know, and I've read that you can get some sort of benefit from a hundred micrograms. So I'll do 400 micro, very small amounts mm -hmm. um, and get in front of a red light. Um, that's kind of one of my things. If I, if I ever think I'm exposed to anybody that maybe is sick, it's one of my things that I like to do is, uh, taking some methylene blue and then sit in front of my red light. Um, you know, I mean, I, I do believe the light can help. It, uh, I mean, obviously there's a lot of research on it, helping rebuild mitochondria, um, and helping decrease viral loads. So yeah, I, I think it has promise. Yeah, definitely. Have you, I don't know if I asked you in the last time we chatted the difference between LEDs and like the heat lamp, because it's funny in like the peak community, it's like everyone's all about the 250 watt lamp and that's all you need. And the LEDs are unnecessary and expensive. But when I switched to them, like I noticed a huge difference from, cause I built like, I think it was like five years ago, my own like four 250 Watts on a wooden board. And it was more like a sauna for me. Like I was like sweating in front of mm -hmm. them. Uh, but I like that you don't get as much heat from the LED version of the red lights. But My understanding, I have a panel. I actually have two panels. Um, mm -hmm. I find that using the LEDs, you don't have to have nearly as much exposure. That's mm -hmm. kind of, you know, I think the people that use the other red lights will sit under it for 20, 30, 40 hours. Um, 
And so I think it does do some penetration, but I think the LA, because they're more concentrated, you can do a mm -hmm. lot shorter period of time. That's mm -hmm. my experience. Um, I actually have a client that purchased, uh, like, I don't know how many bulbs, like a, a red light, infrared light, like, like bed. It looks like a tanning bed, uh -huh. right? Which I've been in one time, which I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> Um, but even those, because, you know, they're not, they weren't even as strong as the ones I have because the bed was designed to be in it for 20 to 40 minutes, I, from my understanding. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I think, I think it's kind of like, what do you want? Um, if you want to sit under that light, you can probably just use one of the, uh, the like chicken lamps and do it for mm -hmm. Pacific. I mean, it still works. You know, you can see that it does penetrate. You, and mm -hmm. like, as Ray says, you can go into a dark room and put it under your skin and see it goes through. Mm -hmm. um, I just find, I, and I don't know, I mean, ever since I've kind of used the panels and A, I use them more often because I don't feel like I have to do it as often and do it as long, but I feel like I get a little bit of significant uh, benefit from that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, my friend Andrew Latour has a lot of awesome articles on it and how companies, I mean, there's a lot of like, I don't know, vampirism going on in the red light marketing space. <laughs> right, probably. Companies <laughs> advertising like 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared at like six feet, which is, I guess, impossible. And they're using solar meters, like irradiance meters for measuring solar uh, solar panels, yeah. uh, which it doesn't correlate uh, to the human body because we're not a flat surface and all these things. So, um, yeah, there's... I can see why people are skeptical about it because there's there's a there's a lot of marketing in the red light <laughs> therapy industry. So, <laughs> yeah, and I would agree with that. I mean, anytime you 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 start making a market, everyone and anyone's going to come in and start producing. And you know, and how do you test that unless mm -hmm. you're testing that? <laughs> right. Um, well, I say we jump into the Q and A because we have like 50 questions here, and um, they're all kind of random and all over the place. So it'll be kind of fun. Okay. Um, um, let's see. Food allergies such as eggs and milk, can they be reversed? Absolutely. And it depends on like, are they having an, an allergy or are they having an intolerance to that food? Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, if anyone has any sort of uh, gut permeability and there's stuff leaking through the intestinal linings, then that's usually what you're going to show up in some sort of allergy test. You know, someone that might eat something very regularly. So, I mean, healing the digestive system or the small intestine is certainly a place to start, you know, and again, is it they're allergic to the milk or is it a, a lactose issue? Um, are they not producing the enzymes? I think some people are told different things and not really totally sure. They just know they can't handle it. But yeah, absolutely. Those things can be fixed. And, you know, and I've had people come in and they're like, they, they, they send their list load of here I tested and here's all the foods I'm allergic to. And I'm like, well, what were you eating? She's like, well, I was eating a lot of eggs before this. I was, eating, you know, so usually a lot of times it's whatever they're eating a lot of is going to show up in the blood. And but again, it, it and those are the same people that are eating lots of foods that might be creating some digestive issues or irritation to the intestinal lining. So again, they're going to get some permeability. Um, as soon as you remove a lot of those foods that might be irritating the gut lining, then you can normally add those foods back in with no issues. That's awesome. Um endotoxin probably plays a pretty big role, right? Cause that kind of increases, that increases intestinal per permeability. For sure. Yeah. Any, I think any sort of bacteria or endotoxin that's coming in through the small intestine is going to irritate the, the lining enough that things can get through, or they're just foods that shouldn't be in there and they're getting through and cre creating irritation. I mean, we, you know, our foods mm -hmm. are filled with so many chemicals these days that those alone be creating the irritation. And, you know, when people start removing a lot of these foods that are inflaming their gut lining, then that alone can make them feel better and able to handle other foods again. That's awesome. Yeah, we have a rule whenever we go out and if we're going to have burgers and fries, you know, because we're just we're human beings, then we bring our own ketchup and organic ketchup. It's made with cane sugar and not high fructose corn syrup, because I think it's those little things that add up. I mean, that just a ton of starch coming in from the high fructose corn syrup. Uh, that's definitely uh, not good for the gut. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, all of those. And again, you know, when I think someone's super healthy, you can have all of those things in a sparingly dosage and it not matter. It's just when we mm -hmm. keep loading it and loading it and loading it and then add a bunch of stress to your lifestyle, <clears throat> that's when you start having issues. But as we know, again, if you know, if you're 
parents weren't super healthy or their parent and we are kind of working down the generations, then we're already working with a system that was compromised just through generations, not genetically per se, but just metabolically. Mm, that's a good point. Um, this is a good segue. Top three tips for gut healing. Uh, <clears throat> remove all the irritating foods, which are going to be the hard to break down foods, right? Nuts, seeds, legumes. I would probably move, remove most starchy food. Or if you do eat starchy food, like cook the crap out of it, I'd probably only have maybe white rice, white rice or really, really well cooked oats, maybe, maybe some boiled potatoes. But um, initially, I might remove all of those. Um, I would cook everything really well, even fruits, um, remove the skins, basically anything that is going to be an irritant or hard for your system to break down, super fibrous foods will, I would say, remove. And then I would certainly add something protective in there, like a raw carrot salad or cooked bamboo shoots or really well cooked mushrooms to help clean the gut. I prefer my, my go-to is still the, the raw carrot salad. Um, and I, because I, I want the coconut oil going deep into my intestinal lining. So, you know, you want to shave it up, wash it, um, lots of coconut oil, a little vinegar and stir it really well. Um, and that's going to allow that coconut oil to get deep into those intestinal lining to kind of scrape it and clean it. Um, so those, and definitely manage your stress. Um, you know, when, you're, when your body's stressed, blood and, and nutrients do not want to go into the digestive sister, the, the, the digestive area. You know, that's why it is fight or flight and rest digest. And these do not go together. And if you're always in that fight or flight area, then the energy is not getting into your digestive system. Yeah, great point. And um, I just found on your website, I mean, it's from early 2017, but you had a Super Bowl healthy desserts and it was uh, baked apples, peaches, and pears with uh, butter, cinnamon, and Parmesan Reggiano. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, I, uh, I mean, when summer comes, I make a huge pot of that, like cooked apples, take the skins off, pears, peaches. I mean, I kind of put anything in there, um, nectarines, and cook it all down with some cinnamon. And it, it's almost like a little bit thicker apple sauce but it's other fruits like a chutney almost and i will literally eat that almost in every meal sometimes um because it's just easy it's good sugars it's tons of nutrients and it you know it's not my my system is not having to work extra hard to break those foods down that's awesome yeah we have two apple trees here and some plum trees and i can't wait for those to be ripe because i'm just gonna live on those oh, for I a bet. few months <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> um, what are other sources of calcium besides milk? Um, I get that question pretty often, like leafy greens, right? Pretty. Yeah, yeah, I will have some, like I have some people that cannot consume milk right now. So I will have them two to three times a week do really well boiled greens, spinach, mm -hmm. kale, um, are the prime ones, you know, and I'm like, they're like, well, no saute, you do need to boil them down. The oxalates will get removed into the water. Mm -hmm. And so, and just have them with a little bit of fat to help basically then be able to absorb a little bit better. But if they're really well cooked, you know, um, they should be okay. You should be able to get a decent amount of calcium through the greens. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting products out there. Like I have friends that sell like pearl powder calcium <laughs> and like there's different ones, but I don't think it's sustainable to rely on a macro mineral with a supplement, uh, you know, no. <laughs> unless it's magnesium maybe. But still. Yeah. And calcium and, you know, and if you're going to have those greens, like a, a good thing to do is have them with like some orange juice or some sort of sugar because calcium yeah. likes sugar to help it be absorbed. It likes vitamin D, mm -hmm. it likes sugar. So that's why milk is quite ideal because it's already yeah. coming with the other components to help it absorb better. Um, but if you can't do that, yeah, some really, really well cooked greens, have it with some orange juice. I mean, I know I've even heard Dr. P recommend like having that before bedtime because having a high mm -hmm. calcium food prior to bed will help with sleep. Um, mm -hmm. But having some really well cooked greens with some orange juice prior to bedtime can be helpful for someone to help with sleep. That's awesome. I I've never I'm done that. It kind of <laughs> sounds gross, but <laughs> <laughs> but, it, I, but it makes sense. <laughs> it does. Yeah. 
I still do the the double. I have the double rainbow brand of ice cream. I my body reacts well to it, and I'll do a bowl of that before bed with some reishi syrup uh, that my friend makes. It's like fermented barley syrup with reishi uh, extract in it. It tastes really good. It's like a chocolate kind of thing. (laughs) Two two ingredient, a little nightcap. Uh, Totally. (laughs) What? Someone asked, why do people, why do different people have different carb tolerance levels and how to improve it? And um, I, my friend Austin asked about this, like, I forget who started this idea, but some people are like fast oxidizers and slow oxidizers or something like that. Yeah, I think that definitely has been an argument. I mean, my belief is different than that. I, I tend to kind of believe it's, you know, there's a lot of factors that might play into role of how well you do with carbohydrates. I think one is the diet that you, you were consuming prior to this, right? So if you were on a considerably low carbohydrate diet, I think your body's always adapting to whatever you put upon it. So if you don't give your body a lot of carbohydrates, it's going to adapt using other resources as fuel. And when you add it back in, your body is not going to know how to manage all those carbohydrates. And so it's a slow and steady process. Um, You know, I find that it's your stress level is a big component on how well you're managing carbohydrates. You know, if you have been not consuming carbs and you're using more keto based diet and the system is stressed, that when you add them back in, you don't manage them well. You, you might show up as a really high blood sugar. In fact, a lot of people that essentially switch from a keto, you know, start getting waking high blood sugar levels, right? So they start to freak out thinking that this is not a good thing. And I'm like, look, it's just your body trying to relearn how to use this, this fuel source. And so to me, it's going very slow and incorporating sugars in quite slowly, frequently through the day, and then slowly starting to reduce the fat intake while increase in the carb intake while, again, managing the stress load. Um, That has to be taken into consideration. And so, you know, I I think, like I said, it's just primarily where you're at in your healing process. Is it going to pertain to how well you you can utilize carbohydrates? That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Let's see. What does she recommend for someone that no longer has a uterus? Recommend for what? Like hormonally, does she have, does she have ovaries? It's not very specific. Yeah. I don't know. I guess just like general advice. (laughs) That's kind of a weird question. I've heard like, if I don't have a gallbladder. she had a hysterectomy. I guess my question is, does she still have her ovaries? If she doesn't Mm -hmm. have her ovaries, then I would pro again, I'd want to look at her diet, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, women that have had a complete hysterectomy and had both their ovaries removed and they're, they're going to have some hard times um, mm. producing enough hormones. Um, of course, you know, your adrenals will still produce progesterone, but again, that, that alone is a horrible stress to the system to remove someone's entire uterus plus o- o- ovaries. So then it would be a set looking at your diet, looking at your life, trying to find some sort of balance for you. Um, And I think it's always, you know, where people get into trouble because they're like, I have this. What is the recommendation for this? And how I like to look at like, okay, we need to look at your entire system Mm -hmm. and the total load of stress on your system. And then we need to work up and trying to unwind that and trying to find out what your body needs, you know, throughout the day. Right. How well do you manage sugars right now? So do we need to give you a lot of Mm -hmm. small meals to manage throughout the day? You know, and what does your day look like? Is it a super stressed day? Are you laying around all day long? And then when we can get you kind of balanced a little bit, then we can talk maybe about adding something like progesterone and maybe it all depends on, again, what their body will start kind of doing for itself. Because ideally, you always want to get the body to do the work. That's awesome. Um, That's a good um, kind of uh, segue to this question. What's best for health, four to six meals a day or two big meals? Uh, generally frequent smaller is less stressful, right? Than huge meals. I used to do that during my OMAD days, <laughs> the huge meals. Yeah. And well, and I think that can depend like yeah. on the person again, right? If, if someone's considerably healthy um, and their, their body stores liver glycogen really well, then could they get by on two meals if they ate pretty good sized meals? Sure. Um, that person might not be really active. I mean, they might be able to handle it, you know? So I think things, it's not one's right or wrong. It's based on what your body needs, your activity level, your health, 
if you aren't very healthy, your, your body isn't enabled to store glycogen very well, then you're probably going to need more frequent meals. If your body is becoming healthier, then usually what I find is we can start doing less meals and, and they will sustain you longer because now the liver is able to keep you sustained while you're not eating. Because that's kind of the goal. You know, you want it to be able to do that. And, you know, so can some people survive on one to two or not? I wouldn't say one, but two. Yeah, I think they can if they eat considerably good and they're healthy um, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've heard Ray say like a healthy person could store liver glycogen for 24 hours. Um, but that doesn't mean fast for 23 hours a day. <laughs> right. And, it, you know, and again, it's like, what are you doing? Is your activity, are you out running a marathon or are you just sitting and watching TV? Like, mm -hmm. right. Cause both of those are going to use a completely different amount of energy. Yep. Yeah. Um, what's the best form of exercise while healing? Um, again, these kind of all come into the, the person. And so mm -hmm. the, if you're really stressed and the body's really ill, then I would say something very low and like stretching or yoga or walking in the sun um, really minimal stuff that really, it kind of just makes you feel better. You know, you're not trying to get your heart rate up. You're just trying to do things that are kind of soothing to you and kind of are supportive for your, your, your system in a healing state. You don't want to add too much stress to that. Um, as you get healthier, I mean, I'm a very big proponent of weight training. I think adding more muscle to your body is a great idea. The more muscle you have, um, the more energy that you're going to use. Um, also some of your hormones are producing the muscle like testosterone. So those things, and they're just supportive, right? The more muscle you have, the leaner you can be. And that is a, to me, a great place to work, but some people aren't well enough to do weight training. Um, cause it's a huge draw on your nervous system and it can take a considerable amount of energy. I mean, not calorically through it, but while you're lifting, um, and if, and if the body isn't in a healthy place, you're just gonna, you're gonna kill it. You're gonna collapse. So mm -hmm. you, you kind of have to, I, I like to tell a lot of people if, you know, if you can't get through your day <clears throat> without massive lulls, um, then you're probably not ready for that yet. You know, maybe just do something a little bit nicer and kinder to yourself without pushing you yourself too hard. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, this is a really good one. One I'm kind of interested in, uh, someone asks, what are your thoughts on liquid meals, smoothies, coffees with milk and sugar? etc. And I noticed there's a huge debate um, among people. And I mean, I get it as a former like liquidarian when I thought that, you know, I was just like extreme. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. I definitely had I definitely had lulls and energy and kind of like lightheadedness. Um, my, maybe because I wasn't doing enough milk. I don't know. I mean, it was more like blue green algae mixes and like more vegan kind of oriented drinks, smoothies and stuff. Um, but yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Like liquid meals? Um, I think liquid meals can be helpful w for a few different reasons. Um, if the digestion is severely compromised and you need energy, they're a quick way to get energy into the system. Um, they can be convenient. You know, if you're traveling to have a liquid meal, I don't think it's wise to normally rely upon only liquid meals. Um, a lot of people that do liquid meals, you know, because it's getting into your system quite quickly, it doesn't leave them as satiated. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, having a little bit more solid food in there takes your digestive system a little bit of time. It's a slow release. So you, you kind of feel um, hungry or less hungry longer. Um, you know, I don't think you should not have your digestive system work at all. Um, but again, if you are severely compromised, you know, I think that's why um, the, the Gershon clinics, you know, when people are coming out of like cancer therapies and they're only, they're just juicing, you know, they're giving them basically nothing to do or work. And when you're in that severely sick and you want all of your energy to be utilized as healing, then it might be a good idea. Um, and, I, and I've certainly talked to people that have gone on 100% juice cleanses and feel really amazing. Um, and again, that could be a slight cortisol response from those. But I think you know, for when you're removing all those fibers out of your system, that can be really helpful. Um, so I'm certainly not against them. I've definitely used them with people. Um, but like I said, on the other side is that they tend to, to seem that most people get hungry pretty quickly on liquid, that they don't feel satiated. People like to chew food um, here and there. 
but I, I think they definitely can be utilized. Um, and spend, like, I, one way I like to use it is when I'm busy and if I'm talking to people a lot through the day and I consume a, a large amount of sugar, just talking, 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 I will have liquid foods with me all the time. It's easy. I can talk. I'm not sitting here trying to eat a plate of food talking to you. <laughs> But I just use I, I use enormous amounts of fuel when I'm talking or in meetings and so forth. And I think liquid meals can be quite good then. Yeah, I can relate when I'm recording a lot for two, three, four hours in a day. Um, I'm doing a lot of milk in that day and it's hard to I almost have to have like pre prepared meals. And um, it's just an interesting topic to me because like my friend Josh Rubin said that younger people can do it better uh, liquid meals. And then I listened to like Patrick Timpone will interview Ray. I'm like, every interview is like, what do you have for breakfast today, Ray? And he's like, Oh, some coffee and sugar or coffee con leche, you know, with milk and like coffee with milk. And that's like, seems like his breakfast most of the time. It's like Ray's like 80 something. He's doing like liquids for breakfast every day. I'm like, how, if it's better for younger people, how's Ray doing it and thriving? I mean, his brain's on. It's interesting. <laughs> I, yeah, I think it's more like, especially in the morning, because your liver glycogen stores are, and I'll have, like I said, I'll have some, and the first thing is sometimes, this is my go-to in the mornings now, I do basically four ounces of orange juice and a cup of milk. And that, like, mm. I literally grab that and go take my dog for a walk. Like, mm. and that, because I know it's going to get into my system quick, it's going to help regulate my blood sugar level. Like, and he's all about, don't let the cortisol, right? That's yeah. all your, your stress hormones are elevating in that time and he wants to get them down. And so we know quick sugars is going to be the, the easiest thing, right? If your food, that, if you don't have to digest, process, break down your food, that sugar is going to get right into the system and have an immediate response on your blood sugar levels. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I would think that he does it, right? He's just trying to get sugar into his system. And that's what I go. I go right in, get the stuff, you know, get some sugars into my body. And then when I get, get back 15 minutes later, I make breakfast. And then I have some solid food because that will sustain me a lot longer. That's awesome. Yeah, that's pretty similar to what I do. I'll drink my homemade raw goat milk and sometimes I'll have some royal jelly with it and some honey and other things. That, uh... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, you can definitely sustain life for sure on liquid mm -hmm. meals. Um, I, I think it just gets a lot, a little boring for a lot of people. <laughs> and, you know, but again, can you do it? Sure. Yeah, I remember gaining a lot of muscle on, I think I was drinking like more than a half, yeah, more than a half gallon of raw goat's milk every single day. And I, I don't know, I gained like five to 10 pounds of muscle years ago doing that. Um, because people think, oh, it's not enough, you know, to actually maintain or build, but I was building. I've thought about doing just raw goat milk and bone broth and kind of, you know, if anyone is going to do like a liquid fast, I have people ask me, that's like what I tell them. Like, so you get pretty much everything from those. <laughs> You, what you can, I think, well, and I've heard Ray said you can live, you know, you can definitely live on an all milk diet. He said the only supplement you would actually have to add is iron, believe it or not. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, it's the one that he, you know, cause I mean, I know everyone's so anti iron, mm -hmm. um, but you still need iron, right? Mm -hmm. If there's still mm -hmm. a, an amount that the body does need. And if, you know, mm -hmm. so if you compl and this is a, a, a very low iron diet, um, for mm -hmm. sure, but, uh, you know, you still have to replenish those stores it's not it's completely the devil you need it you just don't need nearly as much as we're being told right yeah good point um this is a good one do cold drinks lower body temperature leading to a slower metabolism um they won't lead to a small a slower so i think it's just it's i think it's on the same premise as like a heating blanket might warm you up right putting something colder just into your system um, could certainly make your mouth cold. So if you're going to take your temperature, but you know, as soon as it hits your, your stomach, I mean, the acids in your stomach are going to heat and start dissolving everything. So I, I, I wouldn't say it's going to slow your metabolism down. It doesn't really work that way. Um, eating foods that way because of how it's going to get through your system after it, you know, would it possibly cold make your mouth colder? And so if you put a thermometer in there, it would read it colder Correct. Um, just like if you put coffee in your mouth and took your temperature, it might read a little higher. Um, but is that slowing your actually metabolic? No, you know, your metabolic rate has all everything to do with how your cells are using energy, not if the, the food is cold or hot. That's awesome. Yeah, my friend uh, Adam Bergstrom that I've had on the show said, 
he has a lot of really interesting uh, little he things does. that he says. And <laughs> one of them was, if you want to gain weight, drink cold liquids. If you want to lose weight, drink uh, hot or warm liquids. And uh, thought that, I always thought that was interesting. <laughs> And, and I guess, you know, they could produce something, you know, and I guess if you ate, it's, I guess it's the same thought if you had like high, like uh, cayenne peppers and stuff like that, it would kind of make you sweat a little bit more. So it maybe give you, gives you some sort of thermogenics of the body's now trying to cool itself. But at the same, same level, when you're having cooling, your, your body's now trying to warm itself. So I don't know. I don't know if he has like some actual research or that's just his own experience, but I, that's yeah, quite interesting. <laughs> Uh, someone asked, can another juice be used instead of orange juice? Um, I have serious histamine issues with citrus. Yeah, that's interesting. That person emailed me, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, for, for her, what I would say is, is if you're having a histamine issue, then I would want to look at that. Like, why are you having a histamine issue? Um, and we also know that things like estrogen can create... Um, they kind of irritate the mast cells, which will are mediators for increasing histamine, serotonin, and all the other stress factors. Um, so I would definitely uh, wonder about her estrogen levels. Um, but yeah, you can certainly use other juices. Um, I've used watermelon, um, grape, apple, and moderation. I, I think you just kind of have to try different ones and see how they work for you. Um, certainly the citrus ones, there's a lot more healthy components in there. Um, but I mean, I've used uh, persimmon juice before. Um, what else have I used? Cherry juice. Um, again, not as good. You can also use coconut water, but yeah, there are certainly ones you can use. That's awesome. Um, since you mentioned estrogen, uh, ever heard of excess estrogen causing a skin burn, <laughs> kind of like a sunburn, but from the inside, a skin burn. Like where in the inside? Like <laughs> it's from my friend Beverly. I think she she's had like a lot of rashes and skin stuff. She's like sent really sensitive to EMFs, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, as a stress hormone, and I would probably you know let's think about what could possibly occur. I mean, a lot of times I always think skin issues are a, a gut issue. Mm -hmm. It's kind of always the first place that I would go to. You know, so is the gut lining being irritated? Is there bacterial overgrowth going on in there? Um, I would certainly add a carrot salad in and look at also any sort of makeups or lotions. I don't, I mean, I don't know how much she's aware of this. Or any of those things that she's putting on her skin, definitely look at detergents because um, all those be, could be creating the irritant. Awesome. Um, let's see. Thoughts on caffeine versus decaf. So I guess regular coffee versus decaf and tea versus coffee. I think most of the therapeutic effects are coming from obviously caffeinated coffee. That's certainly where all the research is stemming. Um, caffeine is obviously a metabolic stimulator and it helps your body utilize glucose uh, quicker and faster. Mm -hmm. um, as to why, you know, caffeinated drinks should be consumed with calories um, because they, if you, if not, especially if you're highly sensitive, they're going to make you very stimulated. And I, I think that's why people get nauseous or agitated or anxious after they drink coffee. So and if you're still getting that after you have calories or sugar or milk with it, then you probably need to remove it for right now. There's certainly some good properties in decaf coffee, um, not the same as caffeinated and kind of the same. From what I know about tea, it's okay. I think there is some estrogenic qualities from it. Uh, the matcha tea seems to be better. Um, so, and I mean, I've used black tea here and there because of the caffeine, but again, I think there are some estrogenic properties in it. So black, I mean, not black, but caffeinated coffee is probably your best bet. You know, I think other ones can be used in moderation for some benefit. That's awesome. Yeah. And while we're on that, that topic, uh, I, for years I did the French press and then, yeah. um, my friend in Australia, that's the custom builds water machine is Kier. He's a really smart young guy. He, uh, recommended this espresso machine and, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was a job to learn how to use it, but it kept uh, clogging up. And there's so many little things to clean, like the grinder totally. and where the water comes out and the little uh, little filter handle thing. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, that's yeah. A whole, it's a whole little hobby to learn about. There's a lot of trial and error with uh, 
<laughs> yeah, I've coffee. used ones at Friends, and they're like, you know, like $5,000 coffee makers. But like every five or six, I don't remember how many cups, you have to go through this cleaning process. Uh-huh. Empty uh-huh. everything out, clean this. I mean, it takes 20 minutes. And it's self-cleaning, but it's a process for this whole thing to occur. <laughs> where I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to use my little pour over and call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> so you just, is that the only thing you do usually use the pour over with the, like the metal filter? Or... Yep. That's cool. Yeah, I, I had cool. other coffee makers, and I found and it's like it's so much easier to clean. <laughs> um, and I, you know, and since it's just me, you know, I just have my single cup. Um, it and it's small, compact, and it's just easy, you know. So that's what I do. That's awesome. Um, this is a good one. What about those of us that have trouble gaining weight? What do we do? I guess. <laughs> Okay, well, then I'd, I'd want it. So we, I would certainly want to know where his general health is. Um, mm. You know, there's a lot of people that are running around in a stress place. So if their system is overly stressed, you're going to have a super hard time gaining weight. So it's mm. getting out of that state. And that could be consuming, obviously, more foods, more calories, more calcium rich foods. Um, that's got to be a place. And again, you know, so much of people's stress revolves around what they're doing in their life. So you definitely have to kind of take into account how you're you living your life. Are you running around like a chicken with your head cut off all day long? Mm-hmm. Right. And, and a lot of people are. And they're like, well, I stay up till 3 a.m. And which is super stressful for your system. Right. And so and I sleep till 11 and then I have a hard time again. And their whole cycle is just exacerbating this stress state. So we, set, we definitely need to look at your sleep. We need to look at what are you doing all day long? Are you, w- you know, waking up hungry, not hungry? Probably not. You're probably waking up not hungry so, because you're probably in a stress state. So it's kind of changing these habits slowly but surely. A lot of people's state of health is very reliant on how they're living their life. And a lot of them are just like, just tell me some foods to eat. I'm like, well, that's very, you know, it's part of it. But if, you, if you're living a life that's creating the system to be stressed all the time, you just can't fix it that way. So you have to slowly start to like make shift the, slip, shift the sleep, slip some of these habits. You know, it could be addressing the thought patterns and what's going on in their head all day long. Um, you know, there's kind of a lot of moving parts, but it, ultimately you're trying to get the body out of that stressed cycle. And then again, and then it's going to be eating, um, you know, more food essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. There's so much context. Like when I was working three jobs years ago, it's like I always had my cooler with me and I was doing demos for Harmless Harvest at Costco and just, you know, mostly liquid meals. But it's like I had to mm-hmm. be on, and I didn't even know about this information, but I was like always prepping and getting food ready and having it in the car and it's like with cooling packs. And yeah, there's so much, you definitely got to assess someone's uh, personal life. Their, their job, their living space, everything. <laughs> yeah. And food, I mean, food log, food logging help. So most people that mm-hmm. like, who will contact me and they'll say, I can't gain weight. I'm like, well, okay. Hey, what are you eating? Yeah. And they kind of give me this random, this, I'm like, well, have you ever food logged? And you know, no. And I'm like, okay, well then food log <laughs> and then start actually recording it, you know? And then you, you end up talking to this 25 year old male. And then he finds out he's eating like 2000 calories or whatever, and it's 80 grams of protein. I mean, it, and people have no concept until they kind of log what they're really ingesting. And they think they're eating a lot, but you know, usually what you find is they're barely eating through the day and they might be eating a lot in the evening time. And when you're, you know, and you're just constantly burning all these calories. Um, and so it, that, that to me is always a good place to start to actually see what you are consuming. So you can go, oh, well, okay. Yeah, I mean, maybe you need double that, just double your calories. Mm-hmm. Do you often use like chronometer? Because I think that's what I used to use. Like there's like websites. I, yeah, chronometer. I like chronometer. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of because I can actually keep everyone's data in one place and mm-hmm. I can review it really easy and I can make notes on there and they can make notes on there. And it's mm-hmm. easy to go back and kind of look at their history and see what they've shifted. So yeah, that's the one I prefer. Mm, awesome. Um, if someone is healing from years of fasting and low carb, should they remove exercise completely in order to get resting heart rate and pulse back up? Um, again, that's a person specific question. So I, I probably would look at their health again. I mean, if they're really crashed out, uh, maybe, um, especially if they have super low, low, low heart, but you know, if they have other symptomatic issues, you know, so if they're actually starting to have health issues, 
um, sleep issues, um, other sort of metabolic issues, then that might certainly be consideration, but not all the time. You know, I, I find that some people, once they start, some people adapt quite well and, and very, you know, quickly when you start incorporating carbohydrates in. Um, you know, I like to kind of see where they're at and then slowly add 10, 20 grams each week. Um, some people can do it faster than others, but, um, you know, and then we can, they can kind of keep some exercise load in, you know, I think, I think some people need that for their own mental state, especially in today's world. I don't want to take something away that makes them feel better and it kind of helps their mental state. And then normally what I do is I have people take temp and pulse prior to their workout and then like 20 minutes post. Um, if, if they're, as long as they're maintaining their numbers, even if they're low, you know, if they're like kind of low anyways, then I'm usually okay with it. I, it's just when they push themselselves too hard and then they kind of crash and burn and like, what's the point, right? If your <laughs> exercise is pushing you deeper into a state of low metabolism, let's not do it right now. Yeah. I used to love just going to the river in North County, San Diego, just climbing on rocks with my friend in the, in the sun. There was it was an EMF dead zone. So that we just spend two hours there just free climbing on these huge yeah. boulders. And that was a really good exercise. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Anything outside, I mean, using your body weight and the, you enjoy, you're in the fresh air, you're in, you're stimulating your nervous system. All are, you know, I, I grew up in a gym. I was a total gym rat. Um, I used to think that was like the only way you could work out. <laughs> And I have since definitely gotten away from that. I mean, I still like to lift some weights, but that is not the end all. I mean, I couldn't go on vacation without getting to a gym. Where's the gym? Well, where's we have to go to the gym? Um, now that just isn't even in my my mind anymore. That's cool. Um, uh, how to go about adding in carbs after someone has been keto for a while? Um, slowly, right? Right? <laughs> go slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say, okay, how much are you doing now? Are you doing 30 grams? Um, then I would log that and maybe start adding, you know, 10, 20 in each week, equally throughout your day, maybe more so, you know, in the mornings, seeing how you do. Some maybe be able to tolerate more. Um, I would, and I would, you know, keep your fat at a, a considerable number and slowly, what I like to do is probably for every 10 fat grams, I'd reduce that. I'd up it by 20 carbohydrates, usually double and kind of keep monitoring them to see how they're feeling, you know, how their blood sugar is doing, if it's dysregulating them, um, and then keep making those shifts. Awesome. Um, which macronutrient to lower when trying to lose weight? Is it fat? <laughs> so they're trying to, if you're trying to lose fat, um, you know, that's like, again, like, like a catch 22. It has to, you have, first you have to see, are you healthy enough to lose fat? Uh, if the temperature and pulse are quite low and you have a lot of symptoms, then that probably wouldn't be my first advice to you. You definitely need to get you in a better and healthier place until we do that. But um, I kind of use both. So what I, when, when people get to that place, I, yes, I will usually considerably lo lower their fats to around 30 grams a day and up their carbs. I mean, I want them to get, be able to still utilize a lot more energy. Um, and then on some days when they're not as active, um, those are on days, maybe they're working, thinking, doing a lot. Um, I might then have those have a little bit higher fat days and reduce the carbohydrates a little bit and see how they do. And so I kind of shift the macros a little bit depending on their activity level. And then, because again, you know, I, when you start shifting things like that, you have to make sure that everything else stays in tune, that their sleep's not going, that they don't feel hungry, they're not getting blood sugar issues. Um, and so, and I might also, you know, add in a little bit more activity, but we want to make sure that during the day, there's enough energy for them to be able to utilize. Ideally, you know, it's that nighttime hour that we want them to sleep well, but we want to be, have them, you know, start utilizing a little bit more fat in the evening. It's a little bit safer. Awesome. Uh, what does sweating and body odor mean? I guess excessive sweating. Uh, why does body odor scent change? I think your body odor has probably a lot to do with your diet. So if, you know, it's part of your detox system. I mean, your skin is your largest detox organ. Um, so it's basically getting crap out of your body. And, you know, it's, and so that's where you're, if you have a crappy diet, you got a lot of garbage in there. You know, I remember when I used to run health clubs, when 
supplements and creatine and all these things. And all these guys would come in with all these supplements and they'd have the worst body odor. And it was just all of these supplements just pouring out of their system. And it was just horrendous. So, you know, I think if you got bad body odor, I'd probably look at your diet or, you know, what's going on with your gut. Yeah, I think I've heard like the liver has like an ammonia cycle. And if that's off, then that is largely responsible for you know, they're, they're generating or they're putting off tons of ammonia <laughs> smells. Right. Yeah. So if you're pushing yourself into that place, yeah, body odor is going to not be very pleasant. You know, um, just think and even like if you're a big drinker, right? So when drinkers start sweating, it's like they reek of alcohol. You know, I think when you're overburdening, like in overburden your liver, you know, you're going to get it in a lot of, you know, in the sweat. Mm -hmm. uh, what are food tips for too much acidity in the body and teeth decay in postpartum breastfeeding? I guess that's like two different questions. <laughs> so too much acidity. Um I mean, being that the body is some areas are alkaline and some mm -hmm. are acidic, that's always a, <clears throat> so if your mouth is too acidic, because it actually should be alkaline, then there's something probably happening with the gut that is probably producing that. So um, this is, as they would say, a pretty acidic diet um, because of the sugars and the juices. And a lot of things I recommend to people to do is gargle. If you're having some juice or anything like that, gargle with some baking soda because that's going to put your mouth back into a more alkaline place. Um, you could also ingest a little bit baking soda, um, like an eighth of a teaspoon a couple times a day. That's going to be helpful. But, you know, essentially getting your gut in better health and, you know, not having, um, you know, you want to be having daily bowel movements. You want to have being things, you don't want things fermenting into the gut area. I think that can also cause some acidity into the mouth area. So getting things just moving through you is going to be helpful. Um, yeah. I mean, again, you know, every part of your body has a, a different pH. So it's always a, a interesting, like, how do I not be acidic? And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> there are obviously some areas you want to be acidic, um, mm -hmm. but not, not the mouth. So mm -hmm. yeah, you can work on that directly. That's awesome. And then the tooth decay question, I don't know where the relationship is with postpartum and breastfeeding. I've never heard of that, like that relationship, but the tooth decay, I, I often look at K2, like are they eating aged cheese and, or supplementing? But, yeah, um, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I haven't making sure you have enough calcium. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, it's like if you're getting a tooth decay that there's a lot of acidity going on in your mouth, could be the gut issue. I, I don't know the relation, you know, unless your body's just more stressed um, and, you know, because now you're basically, you know, producing milk, which takes an enormous amount of calories. And, you know, so it's, what are you eating? And, you know, maybe she's just experiencing that during this period. Um, but again, I mean, you know, breastfeeding a child is an, an, another stress on your system. And so for you to continue to do that, you need to make sure you're having enough calories and not stressing your system out and other levels um, that could have an effect on you. But yeah, I think you're right on adding additional K2 is helpful and making sure you're getting enough in high calcium foods for sure. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm convinced when I chip my tooth, just gently tipping a glass bottle to my mouth, just going a little bit oh too boy. far, I chipped it in my vegan days. And I, I'm convinced that was a K2 deficiency because I had none for like four plus years, probably longer. <laughs> so. That could certainly play a role for sure. <laughs> um, can, can candida overgrowth be caused by birth control? How do you treat, treat it, I guess, treat candida? Can hormonal replacement have an effect on your gut? Sure. I mean, anytime you bring an excess estrogen into your system, I think that can play a role. Um, you know, I have people who are like, can veganism cause candida? And I mean, I'm like, Anything that's going to disrupt your your gut's health can create a, a, some sort of candida, you know, and it's just the excess is, you know, we all have candida. It's usually the excess is creating problems. And in my experience, yeah, an excess of estrogens can definitely create that and, 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 and create that as a problem. So th those people initially, I would basically, you need to be eating the raw carrot salad literally every single day, removing high estrogen foods. I mean, getting off birth control is certainly going to be beneficial to you. Um, making sure, you know, those are usually the same people that are eating a lot of the greens, raw green salads and all of these things. I'm like removing all of those really hard to digest 
uh, fibrous foods from the diet initially is highly recommended. And usually if you can get those things under control, um, I would say 80% of people will usually have the overgrowth go away. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I think I've heard like, if you don't, if you restrict carbs, when you have candida, that's the worst thing you could do because it'll just spread its tendrils looking for food and just spread throughout the body. The the filaments will go deeper into the intestinal linings, right? Trying to look for energy and food and sugar to consume, right? (laughs) So it's like, it might temporarily go away, but it's going to come back with a vengeance eventually. And I think that's why most people that go onto these candida protocols um, Mm -hmm. that are told to remove sugar, dairy, basically everything that we would tell them to eat um, they, they get better and then it comes back even worse, you know, and then they're on some, and they're like, Oh, it's because I'm not on the protocol anymore. And I'm like, no, it's because what you did pushed it deeper into your intestinal linings and now it's back. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a funny one. Why do doctors keep pushing iron and vitamin D for my kids? If it's so bad, (laughs) don't the doctors have our best interest at heart? (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, your kids definitely need iron, I mean, for growth and, you know, t- to the degree that are they pushing it? I, you know, I, I, I think that's just kind of how they are, are learning to, to, you know, iron's very important. I mean, it's just like the, every doctor you go to, if you show up on a panel with a low hemoglobin, they're going to tell you to take iron without even doing a full iron panel, yeah. um, without checking other ne- necessary things like vitamin A and copper. And even then, you know, we don't know. I mean, I do think that there are probably some true iron anemics out there because maybe you just have an absorbency issue and you're not absorbing it. Um, And maybe kids today, because they already might have some gut issues, there could be some absorbency issues. Um, But ultimately, you know, if you're, if your child is eating a whole foods diet and with, yes, and I think they, they probably can eat more uh, muscle meat proteins. They can handle that. They're still in a growth phase. So all of these um, amino acids that are, they're kind of affiliated with the growth phase are totally fine. Um, the diet just should change after they get out of that phase. They don't need it as much, but right now, yeah, I mean, make sure they get enough meat in their diet. I think that, the, and other animal proteins that are fortified or ha- not fortified, but have mm-hmm. iron in them. <laughs> awesome. Uh, in her book, she has cod listed as a warm water fish and not cold water. Is it still good to eat? Aren't there like different species of cod? I don't know. I thought it was a white fish though. It's like a... <laughs> that is a white fish. It's just a low fat white fish. Okay. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> let's see how to, okay. So now I have, I have three questions bunched together about weight loss. <laughs> okay. How to lose postpartum weight while still breastfeeding. Uh, how to not gain weight while healing your metabolism. Is it common to gain weight while fixing your metabolism? Kind of go together. <laughs> yeah. Um, it can be common, especially if you're coming from a stressed metabolism. So somebody that's surviving on stress hormones, um, because they those alone will burn a considerable amount of energy. And um, when you all of a sudden start consuming a diet that lowers them, and that's why some people, you know, once they start adding more sugars into their diet, they start being more tired, they feel more fatigued. They don't have enough energy and then they start gaining weight, right? Which everyone's like, what, I must be doing something wrong. And I'm like, well, normally what's happening is those stress hormones are lowering and now your body's true state is showing up. So at that point of time, you might, after you start lowering them, you might now be burning less calories than you initially were because the stress hormones aren't driving you. So for a lot of people, you know, and and especially women, um, they also need a good amount of nutrition to get into a healing state because of what they've been doing. They've been depleting themselves. So to get enough nutrition to get into a healing state, it takes a considerable amount of food, um, which at that point, once we start d- dropping those stress hormones, there might be over consuming energy to get the nutritional needs that their body uh, requires right now. So there could be a surplus. Now, if you're spot on with your diet, if you're eating those high nutrient foods like livers and oysters and a considerable amount of dairy, and you could, and if you can stand and, and deal with low fat milks, um, I think a lot of those people won't gain that much weight, right? They can turn it around pretty quickly. Um, if you don't want to eat those foods for some reason or not, you don't like them, you know, you can't do it. And so you have to work with other foods. So it's a little bit more challenging for us to get into that nutritional profile normally more calories are needed 
so that we can get enough nutrients into your system. So, yep, they could definitely have some weight gain. I like to call it more of the, the safety weight. Um, if you manage it properly, it, it can maintain, you know, in the 10 pound ish range, which, you know, I think most people probably should expect that to occur depending on where you're coming from. Um, it doesn't have to be everybody, but it's certainly, you know, in my 10 years of history, most people do gain some weight and, um, you know, and because also if I'm expecting you, if your body is in a severe state and now you're going to do less activity, so we're doing less activity and we might be eating more and we're reducing stress hormones. All of those factors could show up as a weight gain initially, but once your body starts to feel better and you get in a healthier place, then we can start adding some of those things back in. But yeah, I mean, if your diet is, you know, 60% nutrient based, and then you're eating all this other food, you know, if you're eating an abundance of, you know, uh, chips with coconut oil, I mean, other foods, but maybe they're not as nutritionally sound, you know, those are going to be an excess of calories, because they're not going to help us with the nutritional profile. So, you know, those are always decisions that that person has to make. I'm like, hey, you know, if you choose to eat these foods, you know, you can, but it's going to bump up your calories, which may result in you gaining a little bit more weight. So it's always a choice, you know. So if usually I can get them to consume those highly nutritious foods, um, it, it becomes a little bit easier for them to not gain weight and us to be able to get the, the right nutrition in. That's awesome. Um, what do you think about like, um, there's a question from me. <laughs> what do you think about like sauna therapy, like sweating? Because I've used it pretty extensively myself. I'm, I've never had a problem with needing to lose weight, but I've heard like crazy stories of people losing a ton of weight from just sweating. I know that can be a stress, but I wonder how much of that is like them not replenishing mineral loss um, more than just, because I know that's a way to like kind of burn, you know, burn calories, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think it, like it's the same premise of you're just, when you heat the body up, yeah, because your body has to work really hard to try to cool it down. So it's, you're going to mm -hmm. release a lot of fluid, one, mm -hmm. you're going to release a lot of minerals too. So that alone is going to create a weight loss. Mm -hmm. it, it's also dehydrating you on some level. You want to replenish all of that. And mm -hmm. yeah, it, there's going to be a slight level of metabolic speed, but is it coming because you're supporting metabolic health or is it because you're stressing the system more? And I think that depends on the health of the person. If they're already sick, you know, that's why you see a lot of these, these homeopathic functional medicine. They're like, everyone go in a sauna and just sweat all your toxicity out. I'm like, okay, if they're healthy enough, if you're not, that additional experience is just going to create more stress in your system, which is going to create you to conserve more energy. You know, again, it's another load on your system that might just be too much. And so that, that can push people over, you know, and you hear them and they're like, oh, you just had a hurting effect, right? Because you, you, they went in and they got super sick, right? I'm like, no, you just <laughs> pushed your system over, created nausea. You, you probably dropped your blood sugar level and now you're sick. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to do it, yeah, make sure you're properly fueled and with enough nutrition and, and minerals in you prior, um, you know, mm -hmm. but do I think it's necessarily that you need to do that? No, I think, you know, I mean, I think sweating is good. I don't think that you need to push yourself into an hour long session to excessively push, you know, and get again, you know, if you're healthy, sure. Mm -hmm. You know, if you enjoy that, go, good, you know, then yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. I like it. Um, someone says acne is so bad since adding dairy back in and following metabolic eating. What should I do? Um, is it kind of like weight where it's going to get worse before it gets better? Cause that happened to me cause I've had skin issues, uh, why I got into health and my acne got worse when I started this. And then as I healed my metabolism, my skin's better than it's ever been. Um, yeah. It could be. Um, I find that like a lot of people when they add milk and I, I find me a milk, a, a pretty big metabolic booster, mm -hmm. um, because of all the other minerals and components it has in it. And so I feel like sometimes some other nutritional deficiencies appear Sometimes it can be as simple as making sure they're getting enough vitamin A and zinc in can cure that. And so increasing the liver or the zinc can be something that really makes the difference. Um, it, you know, if it continues, I might back off the milk a little bit and try to get it cleared up and then maybe reintroduce it slower to see if you get a better response. <clears throat> I think a lot of people when they OD on milk initially, that it's just <clears throat> their system, you know, and it could be the intestines. It could be just 
Um, their body isn't used to processing that food and it's creating a skin appearance. Again, it can be something to do with the gut. So, you know, probably like I said, try adding in liver oysters. And then if that doesn't work, um, I would take the milk out and go back in a lot slower, still making sure that you have the other, the other, you know, the other nutrients to support it and see if you can get a better response. Awesome. Yeah. I always tell people too, like try different brands. Uh, Cause I know when I lived in SoCal, it's like, there's all these different brands at the health food store of, of milk. Uh, organic pastures is I think the only raw, raw one, but maybe there's better ones that they would do better on that are ultra pasteurized or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some people do, right. I mean, you kind of have to find what works for you. And if you haven't done it in a long time, sometimes those raw milks, um, people don't do well on, you know, they have to go into something that's been a little bit more heated and changed and it's not as extreme on their system. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, what's the most important food or supplement for a recovering vegan? You said, I would say beef liver. <laughs> That's pretty, uh, dairy probably is a big one. Um, you know, I mean, animal, animal foods are so very important, you know, solely because your body just assimilates them better and you can absorb the nutrients better. Um, but God, there's just like, there's not just one thing for a vegan. There's so <laughs> many things, you know, it's also probably removing a lot of those foods that they probably, you know, had a hard time digesting and processing, mm -hmm. but again, they need to go slow too. Um, mm -hmm. I definitely think that, that getting some milk into their diet very, really slowly would be a, a pretty good place to start. Cause I find that those, a lot of vegans are starting having bone issues. Mm. Um, just because of the lack of calcium, um, even if they've been eating a lot of greens, more than likely their body hasn't been able to utilize a lot of what they've been ingesting. And so getting some good dairy into their diet is probably pretty important. Cool. Uh, what are common causes of constipation? Uh, lots of water just makes me pee more. <laughs> lack of minerals, right? <laughs> so we knew we need a lot of the minerals to pull the water into the intestinal tract to help it with a bowel movement. But mm -hmm. slow metabolism is going to be a big component, right? And so what I find with a lot of people, especially if they're running into the, an adrenaline state, because adrenaline can definitely help you have a bowel movement. Um, mm -hmm. As soon as you get out of that stress state, they start becoming constipated because now they don't have adrenaline driving their bowel movements. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, that's when people think, well, I need all this fiber and water. That seems to be the common thought. You know, and, and, and if your bowel's inflamed or it's moving slow, adding all of this roughage, some it can have a temporary Band-Aid, but I, for, I find it normally starts creating more irritation down the road. So I kind of do the opposite, remove those things. Definitely start making sure you get enough minerals in. You know, it's certainly enough magnesium. That's a big component, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly like using the magnesium bicarbonate. Um, that seems to help. Um, but minerals... Um, getting enough easy to digest foods into the, the uh, to the diet and, um, you know, making sure that you are not into that adrenaline state, cause that will definitely, um, help the bowel. And so when you get out of it, just kind of know it could, could be a little bit of a time before it fixes itself. I might, you know, for some people I might add in some cascara sagrada to help move mm -hmm. things through until they're in a better place. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I dealt with that issue as I was healing my metabolism for the last two years. And the raw carrot salad just one a day really helped me with that. I don't know what it was that did it, but that cleared me up. <laughs> yeah. And coconut oil alone can help, you know, give somebody a, a, a bowel movement. You know, if you're not used to that, having just coconut oil in can help move things through. But again, we're kind of supplementing, you know, we're, we're probably not, the bowel isn't working optimally yet because we have to add things to push it through. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think having a da daily bowel movement is super important. So if your system isn't healthy enough to do that, then yes, you can use other supplements to facilitate it having a bowel movement until you get healthier. Awesome. Uh, what brand of uh, BBT or thermometer do you recommend? So I guess you want to measure your your body temperature is there one that you go to or i just use a digital one that i get off amazon i think they're like 12 dollars. i don't even know the brand um i know that the thermal head ones that they have going on right now are actually pretty decent mm -hmm. so those can be utilized um 
probably the, the most accurate is a good old mercury thermometer. Um, but I find most people don't have the patience to sit there and wait 10 minutes for it to give you a good calibration. You know, I just tell people, whatever one you use, use the same one. Like don't have six around your house because they might read a little bit different. And just mm -hmm. usually I like to take it three times digital, like take it and then mm -hmm. kind of, you know, the, the number that, is, that, that you get two of, then that's the number. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, let's see how to get rid of cold sores and Epstein-Barr is viruses in general. <laughs> how to get, oh, I'd be a millionaire if I could just get rid of all the viruses. I think everyone, I think it's like 95% of the population has Epstein-Barr or has been, mm -hmm. you know, experienced. I mean, I definitely had it. Um, you know, when the system is compromised, I think a lot of these viruses are kind of kind of wake up in your system. I mean, that's kind of my theory about Lyme disease, or at least the chronic Lyme world, um, mm -hmm. is that you might have been exposed at some point, And then when you get sick, then it kind of reappears into your system. Um, so the viruses don't like warmth. So getting the body warmer is super helpful. And so getting your body able to utilize energy better is like the most important thing you can do. So again, if the system is compromised, then um, liquid sugars, simple sugars, fruits, anything that you can get into your system to help it use energy is going to be a, a big part of the healing puzzle. If you're getting canker sores, um, it usually means the immune system is compromised somehow, some way. So again, that's going to go back into metabolism and maybe it's a nutrition deficiency. So it's making sure you get enough zinc, vitamin C foods, things that are going to support you. I don't really recommend taking a lot of these supplements. I think you, if you do get in oysters uh, once or twice a week, I mean, certainly milk has a good amount of zinc and other animal proteins and, um, you know, drinking enough juice and getting enough fruits um, can also give you enough, enough nutrients to support your system so that those things kind of dissipate. But, you know, it's always to me, it's coming back to your system. If your body's cold, it can't, it's not going to be as resilient. It's not producing enough heat to fend off any of these. And, you know, viruses that are already in your system, because we all have viruses in our body, are going to start reawakening and showing back up. And so, you know, you, and I, you, know, you talk to people all the time. I mean, every other person I talk to now is getting diagnosed with chronic Lyme. I'm like, do you ever remember getting a tick bite? And, you know, and people are like, I don't know, maybe when I was a kid, you know, so I mean, I, you know, a little bit confusing. I mean, but I definitely think it's just something they're exposed to. It's not kind of reawakening and their system is compromised. And now we're just seeing all of these things appear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I definitely agree. The line thing is interesting because it seems, I mean, I almost wonder if it's psychosomatic partly and that might anger people. Cause it's like, I've been in pain, but it's like, I don't know. We know how powerful the mind is to create pain. <laughs> totally. <laughs> you know, it, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of factors that go into it. And then, you know, I, and I feel bad for these people because I think they've gone down so many rabbit holes and then they go to so many, you know, Lyme literate doctors or functional medicine or their own MDs and they're kind of gone down these paths. And I, and I feel like just what they're experiencing in, into the system is so stressful that it's just exacerbating everything that's going on with them when it's like, you know, if you could just get them out of just doing that and just focus on like something healing protocol. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I like to do a lot of visualization with people. Um, I find it very, very healing just to stop getting them to, you know, like if you're waking up and focusing on every one of your symptoms all day long, you're just going to keep yourself in that cycle. And I know it's hard when you're sick, mm -hmm. but if you can just take a moment in your day and really try to Feel what it would feel like to be better and what it used to feel like and then like see yourself in a healing state and i really think your nervous system likes that and it mm -hmm. starts to create that and you know but you have to do that daily to really work in that system but if you do it does start to create a a system that is moving in that direction a lot easier that's great uh, why would a small amount of added salt cause ankle swelling a small amount I mean, water is still going to pull into the tissue, right? Their solvent solutes go in the same place. So I guess if it was too much for your system and it couldn't, your kidneys couldn't process it, then water is going to go into that area. Um, you know, so I, I would only see that in someone that I would think was on a pretty low salt diet prior to that. Um, like anything, if you haven't been consuming salt and you add it back in too quickly, 
it's usually going to overburden your kidneys and they can't process it. So you're going to hold on to a lot of water. I mean, when I didn't use, when I used to be like no salt, um, when I used to go eat sushi, I would be like blown up the next day from just holding so much water from, uh, you know, whether it's a soy sauce or whatever else. And, you know, now I don't have, cause I consume so much salt. Now my body's used to it. So that doesn't happen. So, I mean, that's, my only thought is that, that that is probably what happened to them. I mean, and, and then, uh, you know, I would have, probably want to have a deeper discussion because sometimes people think that. And then I'm like, well, what else did you do? And they're like, well, I walked around all day long for 10 hours. And I'm like, okay, well, that could have been playing a role too. <laughs> <laughs> do you use the Morton salt, like the pickling salt? or? I do. Yeah. <laughs> I think at some point I, I got like a deal on Amazon. It was like cheaper for me to get these huge boxes. And I got like six, five pound Morton boxes that have <laughs> lasted me. I, I still use it. I think I have two big ones left. I've had them for like 10 years. <laughs> That's a good thing to, to stockpile. I mean, if things keep getting worse. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have plenty of salt. <laughs> uh, what what should I eat if I have uh, IBS, your irritable bowel syndrome? I guess we kind of covered gut a good amount, but any, any more yeah, I think it's like, what do you not eat, right? Don't eat <laughs> anything hard to break down. Um, if you're getting, you know, anytime that the, the intestines are being irritated, it obviously can be a lot of different factors, chemicals that you're ingesting, processed foods, but it's also usually really hard to digest foods. Like, you know, I would remove corns and leafy greens and nuts and seeds and legumes and beans. Um, I might even really reduce meat for a while because that can be kind of hard to break down. You know, chewing to me is super important. You know, make sure you're chewing your food really, really well, you know, especially if you're having some gut issues so your gut doesn't have to work as hard. You know, don't eat fast. You know, people people need to be more present with their meals when they're eating. And like I said, I'm like, it's rest and digest. Those things go together for a reason. It's not digest and run like off in your car. It's like that's you know, that now you're trying to get your energy to digest food, but you're now having to think and drive and, you know, doing all these other things. So you're not going to get what you need to break down that food optimally. It's like sit, eat, allow the system to start doing what it's supposed to be doing. You're going to feel a lot better. Um, so, you know, you kind of always have to consider your place and everyone's life is so chaotic now, you know, to tell them that I don't have time to sit and eat for 10 minutes or whatever. I'm like, I'm sitting in, you know, in my kitchen eating when I'm on the phone, having a meeting <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, you know, that might be a problem. And so if you want your food to digest better, you're going to have to give it some time to do that, it's, you know, or you're going to have to, yeah, that's when liquid meals might come into play. Mm -hmm. That's a really good free tip. Cause I got in a bad habit of, uh, for years, I would, uh, watch YouTube videos like lectures, and I would learn, you know, because I was just working a lot. And I was like, oh, I have to learn at some point. And so I'd watch like these really in-depth like biochem lectures while I was eating my lunch. It's like ever since now, just eating at the table and having a dining table and not watching a screen or, you know, just focusing on my food. My digestion's definitely better. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think we don't realize what is consuming energy and our brain is a massive sugar consumer. And so when we are thinking a lot and doing a lot, you know, we are using a lot of energy that way. And so it's not going to be available. I'm not saying you need to sit in quiet, but not being overly stimulated while you're eating is, is probably beneficial, especially if you're, again, again, if you're compromised, right? If you're not and you can do it, then yeah, then go for it. Yeah. Yeah, you can work up to uh, the ice cream in YouTube space. No, just exactly, <laughs> right. That should be okay. <laughs> um, what does frequent urination in women mean? Um, it usually means a high stress state. Um, usually mm -hmm. when you are stressed, you're going to, um, your renal system is turned on. So you're going to mm -hmm. pee a lot. And so usually at that point, you probably need to have more sugars and salt enough calories to get the body out of stress that should help reduce the urination. The other thing it can be is, you know, on the other side, if you're, re you're releasing a lot of estrogen, you could get a lot of water out of you. So highly estrogenic people, when they start reducing that, they're peeing a lot because estrogen, um, obviously you have a lot of edema with it. Um, so if they're working on reducing that, they can pee quite a bit initially just to get the fluids out of them. But I would say, you know, it's probably more of an 
stress level for most people, especially if they're peeing in the middle of the night all night long. And so it's just kind of like I said, looking at the diet, adjusting the foods to get you out of stress. Sugars and salt are a big, big component, and that should help. Okay, cool. Um, can you get vitamin D from food or only the sun? You can get it from some dairy foods for sure. I think it's normally not as good um, to have it ingested. I mean, obviously your ideal source is the sun. Um, that's where you want to get it if you can. I mean, I know there's a lot of controversy on supplementating the vitamin D. Um, <clears throat> you know, obviously some areas of this world don't get a lot of sun. And mm -hmm. I think those people... Um, I would normally recommend they do low dose uh, supplements of vitamin D. Um, I know some don't, but mm -hmm. I find that food is normally not enough for them and that, you know, that they have to supplement it. But it, obviously I live in Southern California. Still, everyone you talk to here is low vitamin D, you know, yeah. and I just think everyone's system is inflamed. So, and that could be yeah. a, a reason you're not, you know, producing it. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I'm, uh, Actually, next weekend, I'm having a three-way interview with Morley Robbins and Jim Stevenson. He, he mm -hmm. runs like a Facebook group, Seco Steroid Hormone D. <laughs> and uh, they're like very anti-supplementing it because I think they say it's a storage form versus the active form that people are taking. Um, but I like I like what you're saying about the context. I'll bring that up in the conversation, like people in extreme, you know, latitudes or whatever because they might not have the money for a 400 hundred dollar spurty lamp too i don't know but. yeah if you can't have your own lamp and i mean and i and i have people that have a lamp you know and we've tested them mm -hmm. um and i mean i've had people do a high dose like one high dose vitamin d it's literally pulled them out of depression um wow. and they just didn't because they live in northern canada and they just mm -hmm. don't have and they're actually told you're not going to get enough sun out in this area now i mean maybe if they were out there all the time you know fully undressed that they could get possibly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I always think there are people, is it the best? No, mm -hmm. but is it the next best option for their situation? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I, my, my is like, you always have to do the best you can with what you got. And if you don't have that available to you and you cannot afford, you know, one of these vitamin D lamps, then you're going to have to get it somewhere. And that seems to be mm -hmm. a decent option. Yeah. I used to be in like that quantum, sun gazing biohacking crowd <laughs> i was actually promoting that myself <laughs> for a while and uh you know the new sunbathing the sun gazing the ice bath like all that whole thing goes together and they were big into like non-native emfs and like obsessively measuring it with meters and stuff and the one thing i learned from that community is that i guess non-native emfs for example y fry or, or cell towers can literally block your ability to, to sul sulfate cholesterol to make vitamin d and so people's, according to them, like people's ability to actually make hormone D is uh, inhibited Compromise. by just being in a non-native EMF, you know, hell basically. But I think the book Going Somewhere by Andrew Marino, I'm pretty sure he talks about that um, like decades and decades ago. But I always thought that was interesting. I mean, it makes sense if we have all these unnatural frequencies floating around through our body that is going to kind of block or inhibit these natural frequencies from getting in and uh, sure. working how they should with the cell. So that's yeah. fascinating. To me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I find that whole, you know, the frequencies and I, I think it's very interesting. I haven't really dove real deep into that. Um, I think there's so much mm -hmm. new information out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, but yeah, I find that all quite fascinating that how we are probably being influenced by things we cannot see or feel mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Um, this is a funny one. How healthy is olive oil? How healthy? <laughs> um, that's a weird question. Um, I think it can be healthy. I think there's, I mean, moderate amounts are probably okay. Um, mm -hmm. it is a monounsaturated oil, so I, I wouldn't heat it. You don't want to have it under warm temperatures if you want to use it as like a salad dressing and, and, mm -hmm. you know, some level of moderate amount, then I think it's totally fine. You know, again, it depends on the health of the individual. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, people always like to say, but the, the Italians eat all this olive oil. I'm like, but, you know, Italians also cook with a lot of butter. And if you actually go over there and see when they're cooking a good amount of time, they're using butter and the saturated fats. And then they're using the olive oil afterwards. They're putting it on as a dressing. They're putting it on after the pasta is cooked and so forth. So, um, yes, they might use it, but not in the ways that most people think. 
Yeah, definitely. I used to use that, um, or I still do with the raw carrot salad. Like I mix the olive oil and the coconut oil. You know, I'll mm-hmm. slightly heat the coconut oil so it's not solid, and that's yeah. That's a good oh yeah, it's not like getting a big chunk of coconut oil in your carrot salad. <laughs> this is the best part about the summer. It's already a little bit, you know, melted, right. so mm-hmm. I can just drip it right on there. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> um, I should have asked this before with the vitamin D question, but. Um, a more like specific question someone had thoughts on tanning beds in the winter months, beneficial or harmful. So I guess instead of, you know, buying a spur tea or something or vitamin D lamp, going to a gym or doing the tanning bed, do you ever recommend that for clients or? I do for their overall mental health. I don't know how much it mm-hmm. helps with vitamin D. In fact, I don't really think it does, but mm-hmm. people feel better doing mm-hmm. it during the winter months just for the lights component. So there is a, some level that, um, they just feel healthier, you know, when they're doing it. I have, I've had people like that I worked at with in Rhode Island that was, he wasn't seeing any sun for forever and he would go once or twice a week and definitely feel better. Small dosages. Again, you know, I think getting some sun is quite good for you, but you know, I think sun, like everything else needs to be dosed properly. You know, sun is good, but if you're haven't been in the sun all year, you know, maybe you need five minutes. And then you need to work up to it, you know, getting to that skin where you want to be exposed right before that pink layer comes. And I think at that point, that's when it's just gone too far. And that's Mm -hmm. when I I don't know if I've read it actually, especially if you're in the sun, you can actually start diminishing um, vitamin D after you get into the burn stage. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating topic. um, Because I know uh, a lot of like I'll yesterday we were out and just seeing people wearing those really dark black sunglasses while they're sitting on the patio eating their food you know getting the sunlight hitting their skin and i'm just thinking how unnatural is that like they're blocking the signal from their retina and yeah. yet they're giving their body the signal on the skin which has photoreceptors but it's just i think it's creating a mismatch and um yeah it's it's it's, it's interesting like this <laughs> well, and I think that's why plants in a greenhouse, it's usually not glass, it's plastic. Mm-hmm. Isn't that just because mm-hmm. of how the rays, the, the, the glass blocks certain rays so that it would kill the plants. Mm-hmm. So yeah. having glasses with glass is actually going to diminish how your body receives the light. So yeah, it's for, mm-hmm. it lo- you need to take your glasses, sunglasses, everything mm-hmm. off and, and let it be exposed to the light without any sort of sun protection per se. Yeah, I just was interviewed on Justin's uh, Extreme Health Radio, and we, yeah. uh, we talked all about lipofuscin. and it was fun. And uh, yeah, there's this disease called like Stargardt's disease, and it's like a, a juvenile eye disease um, caused by lipofuscin. Funny enough, and part of the treatment is wearing UV blocking glasses because UV will spread the lipofuscin, especially in the retina. And uh, it's funny because yeah. they say it's a vitamin A. Uh, disorder that that lipofuscin is caused by you know vitamin a metabolism going wonky it's kind of funny but don't look at it those is proofs. interesting <laughs> some of the conclusions that it made right. <laughs> yeah um let's see what are your thoughts on spirulina Someone has... as a supplement yeah i guess um <laughs> I don't use any of those. I mean, spirulina, I haven't used that in like 10, 11, 12 years. It's, it's a, is a protein source. Isn't that what they're using it for? I think so. Like yeah. Plant, they say it's like, like a, 70, yeah. 70%. Adam Bergstrom said it. He's seen people like cure their cancer with it. Maybe the chlorophyll content. I'm not sure, but I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'll leave that as I don't have enough information on that. I don't use it personally. Um, so I wouldn't know enough to tell you it's good or bad. You know, I'm like everything, you know, if something works for you, um, then, and you're getting a positive response and, you know, you're kind of taking it into context with everything else, then by all means, you know, use it. Um, is, you know, to me, it, it, it always, you know, having a, a good food foundation is always best. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to have most of your nutrition and energy from food um, supplements mm-hmm. that can add to it if you need mm-hmm. them. I mean, I'm a, I like to experiment. I like to try things to see what kind of effects they're having. But ultimately, you know, reducing my stress, making sure I'm breathing optimally, moving enough, having social interactions and eating well, I think is 95% of the puzzle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I being, you know, owning a supplement company myself, I always am careful to give that context because I'll get countless messages like, 
do you recommend this for this? It's like, well, are you doing the foundational stuff? Because if you're not, this isn't going to work as well. But, right. Yeah. Everyone's looking for quick fixes. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, and, and, you know, and, and you hear some of these stories and everyone, I mean, people have this, been on these journeys for 10, 20 plus years and everything they've done. And, you know, they're, they've done 20, 30 supplements and, and, you know, they're not eating. And I'm like, you can't like the, the, your cells need fuel and energy to provide you with all of these components. The, all the supplements without that is just going to create more stress. So, you know, you have to have, and that's what drives me nuts about a lot of these functional doctors is they don't, a lot of them don't address that part of it. And if you don't have that, the system able to utilize enough energy, then all of this other stuff is going to work very mediocrely and it's going to cost you a lot of money. Fully, fully agree. Yeah. Coming, I, mean, I would say I'm still kind of in the biohacking community or at least watching it from afar <laughs> and, uh, right. The molecular hydrogen, you know, drinking the gas or breathing the gas is yeah. really popular. And I, Ray said it's like an alternative form of energy, which to me is kind of cool. Um, but why not have the primary energy and then add that on top? Don't be keto and do hydrogen, which most say 99% of people doing the hydrogen are doing that. Yeah, I see that average a lot. I mean, it seems like Patrick Depone average, I mean, advertises <laughs> that a lot on his site, which uh -huh. I'm kind of curious about, but like, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all right. Yeah, yeah. I do the tablets and the drinking the gas. That's like the affordable way to do it. If you don't want to spend like you know four plus grand on the machine to breathe it, but um, there's some things like there's some leftover magnesium in the tablets, and some people are like, oh, it could cause poisoning and all that. But I think it's such a small amount; it doesn't matter. But uh, but again, it's it's an extra thing. Of course, <laughs> it's not exactly a foundational thing. Um, I basically mainly use it for a non eta BMF mitigation for peroxy nitrite and uh, even lipofuscin, uh, the hydroxyl radical neutralizes, turns both of those into water is my understanding. But um, anyway, <laughs> uh, adaptogens, I guess to finish off the supplement question, reishi, cordyceps, lion's mane, ashwagandha, maca, I guess it's probably the same answer <laughs> you just gave, but do you ever put like reishi or cordyceps in your coffee? Or anything or i do not um <laughs> i think some people have done like i work with some people that you know like the, the, the ashawangas and uh mm. the rhodiolas they have helped them with some hormonal issues although again i think they're slightly estrogenic <clears throat> so i think some of these components can help but if you're usually what i find you know they might be doing a lot of these supplementations but if we can get the food right then they don't need any of them anymore mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of where you want to get, right? I mean, it's like you, if you don't want to rely on something to yeah. adjust you if your system can do it itself, because that means that the system's still off, right? If you remove the supplement and all the, and all the symptoms come back, well, then the system isn't working optimally by itself. And I think we all need to understand that our bodies have the capacity. I mean, our bodies are so amazing that when we give it enough of the right substances, basically fuel and nutrition in the right environment, it can figure a lot of this out, you know, and we just kind of have to be patient. It might not be completely clear and you might have to do certain things at different times and add them in, you know, at right times. But I think ultimately, you know, if, if you're very aware of what the stressors you're putting upon the system, you can get yourself in pretty good health um, with making small steady changes that support metabolic health. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, I personally use most of those things like before an interview or if I'm going to be speaking, and if someone's in that kind of place where they just want a little extra boost, that's, I think they're great, but make sure they're doing the foundation. <laughs> yeah. Or, I mean, like to me, sometimes you want to use them until you can get them into a better place. And I think mm -hmm. they can be used as kind of bridges to mm -hmm. better health. And then some people just do better, a little bit better on them. It kind of use like, like you said, he gives them a little extra boosts, mm -hmm. you know, but still, I think you can get most of your health issues fixed with use, utilizing the foundational principles. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, th someone asked, does it matter what percentage of your daily carbohydrates come from sugar, uh, honey, white sugar? I guess they mean like concentrated sugar sources. Uh, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing he's thinking like simple sugars versus carbohydrate mm -hmm. or complex carbohydrates. Uh, it, different people are going to work differently. Some people seem to do better on a like 50, 50 kind of starch sugar. Um, I think some people just feel more satiated using some starch. 
Whereas some don't do very well in starch at all because of their gut issues. So for them, I would use a, 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 a larger amount of the simple sugars, you know, obviously on a weight loss, um, if you're on a, on a, on a weight loss uh, journey, then maybe utilizing the simple sugars is probably more ideal. Having fructose mm -hmm. in the sugar seems to be more metabolically supportive. Yet, I wouldn't say that's true for everyone. I mean, I know like in the scientific world, yes, fructose can be more metabolic than glucose. However, I mean, a lot of people I find need some starch through the day. And, mm -hmm. but I, you know, for those people, I always make sure they have some sort of fruit with every time they consume a starch. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't think there is a set amount or a number for any set person. I think it's just finding what works for you. And, you know, if you are, you know, getting into a place where you're trying to lose body fat, then yes, usually getting the sugars up there a little bit higher, maybe mm -hmm. even removing the starches for a while can be beneficial to you. Awesome. Um, kind of in the same vein, should I prioritize sugars, uh, or starches? as a highly active athlete. I'd imagine starches. But... <laughs> I would say both, right? Mm -hmm. Like it all depends on when you're working out, you know? So if you mm -hmm. want, if you're working out in the morning, you want to get some quick sugars into the system and have something in the system before he goes and work out. And then post workout, you definitely want to get some more quick acting sugars to mm -hmm. fill up glycogen stores with some protein. So, you know, that's when things like chocolate milk come in. Um, Starchy foods are still needed. I think they, they just, they need an abundance of calories. I find athletes just need more. So mm -hmm. to just put them all on simple sugar seems to be too much. It's just, it's not as sustainable and they just need more food. So having more white potatoes in their diet um, and possibly some white rice, you know, is needed. And, but then again, it comes, it's going to come back to their gut health. Um, some okay. people, if they do not have good gut health, we kind of have to maneuver these foods around a little bit. But yeah. most athletes do best on both. And then, of course, like I said, you want the simple sugars around the times that you're usually working out. Okay, awesome. And, um, and Kate, we have like five or six more questions. Are you still good on time? Or uh, I got about five minutes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll prioritize the best ones then. Uh, SSRI withdrawal, best advice. <laughs> Woo! Um... <laughs> Again, not a doctor here, um, but certainly worked with people trying to get off their antidepressants. Um, I think it just goes slow and steady. Um, mm -hmm. Probably uh, from what medical doctors tell people, I, I find that they tell them to get off way too fast. Um, and so it's like whatever they, they say, taper it quite slow. You know, you need to taper slow and steady. Let your body adjust, taper it slow and steady, you know. And so... Mm -hmm. um, you know, those, uh, to me, those things mess with people's minds so bad, especially the anti-anxiety, the antidepressants that, you know, the slower you get off, the better. You're probably going to go through even when you get completely off a few weeks of just feeling wonky. And mm -hmm. at that point in time, it's supporting yourself dietarily the best that you know how, you know, don't do this during times of stress, obviously, either, because mm -hmm. that's not going to help the situation, you know, get it in a time where you have a little less stress, you can taper pretty slowly, support the diet with enough nutrition and food. And, and you know, like that, if it gets to a point where it's something stressful again, don't taper at that point, keep it at that same level for a little bit and just be patient. You know, it's not a race to get off. You want to be able to get off. <laughs> yeah. So go slow and steady. That's great. Yeah. I still want to have a whole episode on serotonin because it's one that I still haven't wrapped my mind around, but it seems like we've been so bamboozled with that whole subject of serotonin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are some decent books out there about it. I, uh, God, what do I have? Um, I can't think of her right now. There's a, there is a doctor, I forget her name that wrote one and she's a medical doctor, but it was on the entire, the serotonin is, you know, the absolute wrong drug to, for us to be looking at. And I actually can think of it, but I can't. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, completely bamboozled a lot of people. And when you do look at it as a stress hormone, how it's activated in the system, you start having it to look at it completely differently. Mm -hmm. um, last question here. What would you recommend to check hormonal levels? Um, an alternative for the Dutch test because they sell data. <laughs> Sounds nice. <laughs> I guess it depends on what hormones they're looking to get checked. Um, I don't find, honestly, I don't, I don't put too much emphasis on lab tests because I think it just gives you a blip at a time. 
And, you know, if, if a woman's going to get their estrogens checked, doesn't mean just because their estrogens levels are low in their blood, certainly doesn't mean they don't have estrogen stored in their tissue. Um, so I, I don't use that as a general guide. Um, you know, I think you can just go get simple blood labs of estrogen, progesterone. Again, you know, put so much em emphasis on it. If you're looking to get thyroid, um, again, TSH, TS, TSH is only going to tell you so much. Um, getting reverse T3, I think, is also helpful as in T3 and T4. But still, you know, those all those numbers can be altered depending on your stress levels. So to me, you know, instead of doing all that, like save your money, food log, take temp and pulse, you can get a better idea of what's going on in your system on a daily basis and how you're reacting and kind of monitoring your sleep, mood, food, um, energy levels, you know, and that will let like, guide you, you know, again, labs are what doctors use to learn what kind of medicines to give you. It doesn't really mean it's giving you a good overview of, of what your health really is. Cause I, you know, every day I have people show me their labs and like, they look totally normal by what their, their doctors would tell them there is fine. So obviously something's wrong though. Oh, that was great. Well, um, well, awesome, Kate. I know you got to run and, uh, thanks. Thanks so much for this. I think people will get a lot out of it and I'm sure a lot of those are frequently asked questions that you get. So, yeah, no, that was a, you like hit like half of them. I think I'm like, I think people are emailing you and then they're emailing me. <laughs> That's great. So, no, well, that was really great. Uh, yeah. That was a lot of fun and appreciate you sharing your, your knowledge and wisdom and I'll, uh, I'll put a link to your website and your book below. I think everyone should read it. Um, it's awesome. And uh, thanks so much. Um, stick around while I close out the show. Thanks for coming on again. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. That's a wrap for today's show. What do you guys think about that? I love Kate's perspective on things. And it's really funny because most of these questions... I believe she addresses in her book, How to Heal Your Metabolism. So just reading her book and supporting her work, you can really get most of those answers. And then I think after that, it's just a lot of experimenting and trying different recipes and combinations and seeing what works for you. But the basic idea is that we're not going long periods besides when we sleep without food, we're not skipping breakfast, and we're not restricting macronutrients. That's really the basic idea that I get from this work on the metabolism. You're not restricting carbohydrates, you're not restricting animal protein, and maybe you're restricting saturated fat depending on your weight goals. But for a lot of people, a lot of people that I talk to, that's not as much of an issue. In fact, a lot of people have to gain weight because they're underweight from being on a vegan diet or being malnourished for a long period of time. There were some questions that I didn't have time to ask her. Uh, one of them was uh, pretty obvious. Will fasting ruin your metabolism? Uh, it's definitely yes. And she breaks that down really well in her book. You want to give that a read. Uh, the other question is, are veggies so bad if you're getting them from biodynamic farms? And again, I'm not really a fan of restricting anything. Maybe in extreme situations, you might have to limit things at certain stages. But Dr. Cowan's powders, I love. And I sprinkle those on my white baked potatoes or sunny side up eggs. They go really well on. And there's compounds in plants that aren't found in animal foods and vice versa. And so I think it's definitely smart to include variety. And I love Dr. Cowan's powders because they're a really easy way to do that. Uh, someone asked thoughts on coconut sugar. I prefer sucrose. And I don't know what Kate Deering's response would be. I would imagine she would say the same thing because with coconut sugar you're getting some minerals but if you're eating in a balanced way then you're already getting those minerals you're doing raw milk and beef liver and oysters maybe once or twice a month then you're getting those minerals and for me i would especially say shilajit 
then you're definitely getting all the minerals. And in that case, you could just do sucrose, which is just pure refined cane sugar. But I think people freak out when there's something that pure. I don't know why. Maybe it's programming by the industry. But I question what form of minerals are in that coconut sugar. And so personally, I don't consume it. Someone says, I'm intolerant to foods high in sulfur. What can I do about this? So when I think of a mineral like sulfur, I like to think of its antagonists. So on the other side of the seesaw of sulfur, what's there? And there's copper, zinc, and B1, thiamine. That's on the other side of the seesaw, opposite from sulfur. So I would look at those values. I think if I had sulfur issues, I would get the full Monty iron panel because that measures copper and ceruloplasmin, which is a protein from copper. So really look at your copper status, especially, and do things to raise that up. You might have iron overload that's highly likely if you're having any health issue whatsoever, uh, especially related to minerals because iron is just a constant oxidative stress that will make you burn through a lot of your minerals, especially magnesium and copper. So if that were me, I would do magnesium bicarbonate four to six to eight ounces a day. I would look at the water I'm drinking. I would take Shilajit, 500 milligrams to one gram a day. And I would definitely get the full Monty iron panel to figure out what's going on with my body and why it's reacting this way to sulfur containing foods. I think that's all of the questions. I think that'll help a lot of people. Uh, really interesting questions, pretty diverse. And yeah, check out Kate Deering's stuff. Her book is awesome. And her website is katedeering.com. She has some blog posts up there. Her coaching link is up there. You can buy the book through her website there. And support her work because she's doing awesome stuff and sharing great information that's helping a lot of people and helping to reverse a lot of what we've been taught, the damage of what we've been taught, especially in the alternative health community, because we tend to go to extremes. And if you want to support my work and the show, you can go to matt-blackburn.com. I have my CLF protocol up there, all my recommended products. And a lot of you might not know that I have a YouTube channel. You can just search Matt Blackburn on YouTube. And I have some really good videos, especially on water. If you're confused about drinking water, I have a lot of videos on magnesium and pristine hydro water, which are pretty informative. And you can also support me through my brand MitoLife. I have a mitochondrial focused supplement line. And I really focus on foundational things. So vitamin E, vitamin K27, Shilajit, and I'm actually releasing a new magnesium product very shortly in the next couple weeks. So look forward to that announcement. I also have really powerful enzyme products on there. Dissolve it all, a systemic enzyme, digest it all, a multiple digestive enzyme, and dairy absorb, which is very helpful for people that have issues with consuming dairy products. So that's it. Thanks for listening to the show. And I'll see you on next Friday's episode. Today's quote is by Kate Deering. Gelatin contains a positive amino acid profile void of the inflammatory amino acid tryptophan. For purposes of decreasing inflammation, increasing gut health, improving sleep, decreasing allergies, stabilizing blood sugar levels, improving memory, muscle sparing, liver detoxification, and improving hair, skin, and nails, this is a great thing. Remember, excess tryptophan is linked to many inflammatory problems. I should note that, for purposes of muscle building, gelatin is not ideal. Dairy, eggs, 
mussel meats, fish, and shellfish are all better options since they are all complete proteins. At the end of the day, when it comes to protein, real food is best, always. Protein powders have their place when convenience is an issue, but they should be used sparingly, not 50% of your protein intake. Protein powders have become big business in the health and fitness industry, contributing to the billions of dollars we spend on health products every year. Yet, can a food product that is overly processed and contains food additives, synthetic vitamins, heavy metals, and artificial sweeteners be considered healthy? I don't think so, and maybe you shouldn't either. If you want to obtain a high metabolic rate with great digestion and a lean body, then consuming unprocessed, real food proteins are your best option.